Okay, so uh, any problems, surprises, or issues with uh, quiz seven? No, it was pretty, pretty good. Okay. And like I said uh, before, uh, we're now going into the final sort of three topics, right? We just did the, the first of those, which is the knapsack cipher. So the quizzes are going to look a lot more like what you used to in Crypto One, which is something related to uh, whatever crypto system we're dealing with, and then implementing it or answering a particular question related to that, right? Um, so there's just a couple of things um, to do today. Um, we went over and established the uh, the ground rules, uh, rules for the uh, knapsack uh, crypto system, right? Um, we did some examples of four bit um, uh, four bit knapsack, and in the notes there's an eight bit eight bit example, and you can easily see how you can generalize it to n bit, right? To any size you want. Um, one of the things that um, I think uh, one of you mentioned last time is, you know, you, uh, you do a little bit of Googling on the Knapsack Cipher and you'll find that it has been broken, right? Um, so I wanted to just talk briefly about uh, the security issue behind uh, the Knapsack Cipher, right? And the interesting property that, it's funny, we set up the, we set up the, we designed the Knapsack Cipher, no, we didn't, but it was designed um, because of the subset sum being a very difficult problem to solve in general, right? And when you create this super increasing sequence, it then reduces to a special case of subset sum that is very easy to solve, right? Polynomial time using the greedy algorithm. And basically the knapsack cipher is a way of hiding that super increasing, se uh, super increasing sequence so that you can't solve it using the greedy algorithm. However, the assumption there is it's not possible, given that trapdoor sequence, right, the trapdoor set A, to go back and find the original super increasing sequence S, right? So that was the inherent assumption, right? So given A, so maybe we'll write that on the board here, right? This was one of the assumptions that we made, right? So the assumption, assumption, if I could write properly today, that would be great. Assum Assumption. Okay, uh, the assumption is that if you're just given A, right, where A is your um, trapdoor set, right, um, just given A, it's not possible to extract the original um, super increasing set S. Okay, it's not possible, not possible to determine determine the original set S, super increasing set. And this is actually true, right? It's not possible to determine the set S in polynomial time, but it turns out, and this was Shamir's paper in 1984, it turns out you don't need to find the original super increasing set S. You just have to find some trapdoor pair that gives you any super increasing set S, right? So that was the problem is that the assumption, while it still holds, it turns out that you don't actually need to determine that. You can find any super increasing set S. Okay. So basically that doesn't matter because we can find any, um, any it's called, they're called trapdoor pairs, right? So any what are called trapdoor pairs any trapdoor pair. And if you're looking in um, Shamir's original uh, article, he calls these M and W. In our, in our terms and definitions, we call them U and B inverse, okay? So Shamir originally calls these um, M and W, but we call these U and B inverse, okay? So if you're reading the paper, everything's going to be in terms of mod M and your multiplier, the inverse is going to be W, right? If you're just using our notes, which most of us, so I imagine everyone's more comfortable with U and B, so we'll continue with this with this notation. Um, it's just U and B. So you don't need to find the original U and B, right? So in other words, the U and B that you find here don't have to be the ones that were used to determine or 
were the ones that were used to map the super increasing set S to A. Okay, so you can find any of those ones. Um, and the way that you do that is you use an approximation for the ratio of those um, terms. Okay, so you find any trapdoor pair using this ratio, which is the ratio of, again, if you're reading Shamir's, it's going to be called W over M. W over M. But in our notation, this will be equal to V inverse over U. So if you can get an approximate value for the ratio of the inverse, right, of V uh, mod U and U itself, then you can easily start doing a search for trapdoor pairs, and you're very, very likely to find some trapdoor pair that actually allows you to go from A back to not this original super increasing set S, but some super increasing set S, and then you roll out the greedy algorithm and you get your solution, right? So let's do an example of that. I'm just, to do an example of this, again, you can, you can look in the paper and see it in general, right? Or you can go through and, and use the general notation. But it's easier, let's just stick to the example we did last class, right? <clears throat> so last class, um, we had, we were given, or we actually derived, right? So last class, we computed, computed A is equal to, so this was our trapdoor sequence, it was 9, 21, 33, and 29, right? So 9, 21, 33, and 29, 29. And we did that using um, our parameters here, as far as I, what I have here in my notes, we used, uh, where is it again? We used v, v inverse, we used, a, we used a V value of three, right? Which implies that the V inverse value was 41. Okay. So we used um, U is equal to, in this case, 61. V is equal to three, which meant that our V inverse, when we determined it, we determined this using the EA, just like you did at the quiz, right? Um, so the V inverse, the inverse of 3 mod 61, we got to be 41. Okay, so now when we go in this paradigm where all we have is the trapdoor set, we, we don't have U and V. What we have to do is run an algorithm, and this was Shimir's technique. It was a two-stage algorithm. The first stage of the algorithm comes up with a reasonable approximation of just given this data, just given the trapdoor set, it can find a very reasonable value for the inverse divided by u. Okay, so last class we computed that. So in other words, Shamir's algorithm is going to say, here's your trapdoor set, and your um, ratio of the inverse to u is going to be pretty close to 41 over 61. So we have that the ratio, ratio of, not just the ratio, let's just write it out mathematically, right? So we have that our ratio of the inverse over u is going to be approximately, right? It's not exactly going to come up with the exact ratio, but Shamir's algorithm will give us an approximation for it. And it should be somewhere around 41 over 61. Right? So 41 over 61. Again, that's not information that we, that we would have, but we'd be given the actual interval on zero to one for which this is true, right? So Shamir's algorithm, we'd run the first stage of it. And it would give us something like this. It would say, uh, it's about equal to 0 0.67, okay? So 41 or six, so this is what it would give you, 0 0.67. Again, you wouldn't have this, this is hidden. We don't know those parameters, but after the first stage of the algorithm, we get a reasonable approximation for what U and V should be, right? And that analyzing how it does that, that's the tricky part of the paper, right? Um, basically, how it goes is, as if V is smaller, what you're going to find is if this is a really long sequence, this trapdoor sequence, you're going to find that you can predict when it flips over. So here we can see that we go from 9, 21, 33, and now we're at a number less than 33. So we know, we, we, we know that we've gone through one mod cycle here, right? That's the idea. So with enough information like that, we can come up with some pretty good estimates of how large the multipliers are, and how big the um, uh, how big the the modulus is. Um, we know that the modulus can't be smaller 
So the overall value for you can't be smaller than any of the elements in the trapdoor set, obviously, right? So in other words, there's no way, given this trapdoor set, that u is equal to 32, because I have a 33 right there, right? So you have this lower bound that you're given for u, and then you simply go through and you try to guess how many times you've oscillated through a mod modulation, right? Given those multipliers, okay? So, and that's, and it's a complicated thing to do, right? But it turns out that it can be done in polynomial time, right? So you get your approximate uh, ratio there, right? So let's um, do the second stage. So that's all, that all, that all happens in the first stage, right? So this is the first stage of Chenier's hack, first stage. And then in the second stage, you go about actually finding the trapdoor pair, right? So let's find a trapdoor pair here. Um, if we want to do this, so some uh, part of this is automated, right? But basically, the conditions that we're, we're looking for here for a trapdoor pair um, is that whatever modulus we have, it must be greater than the maximum value that we see in the trapdoor set, right? Um, everything else is is just based on the definitions that we have for this this process, right? So one of the things I did is coded all those. Um, so in Python, obviously, I had to do a quick search, right? And when I coded this in Python, I came up with, for example, u is equal to 150 and b inverse is equal to 101, right? So uh, this would be the second stage. So found using this ratio, so using these two pieces of information, I'll circle them here, using just this, using just this a, just this piece of information b, Okay, so found using A, A, B, two pieces of information that I've circled on the board, the original trapdoor set, the approximate value for the ratio. Um, what I found very quickly was U is equal to 150, B, B inverse is 101. So U is equal to 150, this is equal to 101. Okay, now obviously when I say found, there's a whole bunch of restrictions, right? So you start off by picking a U value, right? Then what you do is, so again, the method, a little bit of the method, right? Using rough method as follows. Pick a U value and then compute what you think your V inverse should be by multiplying it by the ratio, okay? So the method is take U and then multiply that by the ratio 0 0.67 to give you v inverse. Then what you do is you have to check that you have a v inverse value that's relatively prime to this u. If you don't, you go back and pick another u value again. Okay, so basically you're using the ratio to predict your um, uh, v inverse value, right? And then you're doing this over and over again until you get that those two numbers are relatively prime, which they have to be. So in this case, 101 is relatively prime to 150, and we're good to go, right? And once you're good to go, you just multiply. So again, you're going to take these values here, these eight values, multiply them by the inverse, and you'll get not necessarily the original super increasing sequence S, right? Uh, but you will get um, something that allows you to solve, right? So using V is equal to 101, I'm going to take A, multiply times 101, and everything is going to be mod. Okay, so what does that give me? Well, let's do it right here. So if we do, actually, I think I already worked it out here, right? So if we go with this one, I so I ended up getting 21, 33, and no, uh, yes, 9, 21, 33, and 79. And I think that worked. Okay, so now let's just do the first few of those together. So if we do nine times. Mm -hmm. nine. Okay, so that's 909, and then divide by 150, divide by 50, minus 6. Yeah, so that gets me this value. Okay, so now 21, 33, 79. Okay, and that's good enough in terms of solving for a super increasing sequence. We have that 9 plus 21 is 30, which is less than 33, 
And then the critical thing here before is that 29, right, um, was not greater than the sum of the previous three. Okay, but if we sum these previous three, that's going to be less than 79. So now we can go ahead and use the greedy algorithm to solve. So let me just see. So Curran is asking, how do we get the ratio if u and v are private? U, so remember, that's in the linear programming part of um, Shamir's algorithm. Okay? So if you're wondering, you know, so if I ask you a question to do this, that's your, you're anticipating what's my next move going to be here, right? Um, I'll give you an approximate value for the ratio, right? So I don't, you don't want to spend your time doing linear programming. This is a crypto course. That's a whole other math bag of tricks, right? Um, so I'll give you the ratio and I'll give you the original trapdoor set. And then you write the method that just picks a random U value according to the parameters of this crypto system and then predicts what the inverse should be, tests whether they're relatively prime, and then goes ahead and constructs the super increasing sequence to solve. Okay. So that's the idea. Let me just, uh, I'm just going to mute Chris there. Okay. Okay. Um, so another, so the other thing we did is we, uh, we encrypted something last class. We encrypted, um, what was it? We encrypted binary 1011 using T prime is equal to 71. Okay. So we'll just show the business end of this. Okay. So if you recall at last class, last class, we encrypted, encrypted zero one one uh, with T prime is equal to seventy one, right? And again, seventy one. So remember that that was this the sum of these three numbers one zero one one. Okay. So what we need to do to show that this actually works is we should at least compute the original T value. Right, and T value is going to be V inverse mod 150, right, and then use the greedy algorithm on that value with this as our, um, this is now our super increasing set. We can call it S prime because it's not that original one S, but it'll work just fine. Okay, so let's do that. Let's calculate um, 71 times, so again, um, T, the original T is equal to T prime times V mod u. And in this case, we're not using u is equal to 61 and v inverse is equal to 41. We're going to be using the same ciphertext, 71, and be multiplying that by uh, u v inverse, which is 101. Everything will be mod u, which is 150. Okay. So now we do that quickly here. Let's just do that. So we take 71 times 101. Okay, so that gives me 71, 71, right? And then divided by 150 times 150 gives me 121, right? So my new T value is 121. So this is equal to 121. And what I should be able to do now is instead of solving the general subset sum problem for uh, this non super increasing set and the value of 71, I should be able to solve it using the greedy algorithm using this modified super increasing set and the value 121, right? So let's just do that here. Let's do the greedy algorithm. And the greedy algorithm, if you remember, I need a little bit more room for it. Okay. It says start with 121 and take away the largest value you can find in your uh, super increasing set. In this case, that's 79, okay? So minus 79. Okay, so what does that give me? 21 on this side and 21 on this side is 42, right? 42. And we're gonna take 42 and subtract the next largest number. I can take a 33 away from that, so minus 33, okay? And 42 minus 33 is 789. And 9, I cannot take a 21 away from, but I can take that 9 away. So 9 minus 9 is equal to 0. And of course, the original plain text, we have it right now. It's 79, 33, and 9. 79, 33, and 9 is your original 1, 0.
So a neat little trick that um, Shamir developed. And um, what it really did was it, it you know, it, now this crypto system, it's, uh, it's been sunk, right? Can't use it uh, because of this little tricky vulnerability, right? The ingenious method he used to come up with the ratio. And once armed with that ratio, polynomial time will get you any UV, so any UV inverse trapdoor pair that gets you some equivalent super increasing sequence, but not necessarily the original one. Right? So let me, so Mark asked a question, will the derived sequence allow for decrypting a ciphertext? Absolutely, Mark. And that's what we just did here, right? So we have this. So in other words, what the algorithm produces after the first stage and the second stage is it produces an equivalent super increasing sequence S prime which is not necessarily equal to this original one, okay? So remember the assumption of the security of the system was based on you're never gonna be able to get back that original one in polynomial time. And that's still true, but you don't need it, right? You can just get away with any super increasing as long as you find the pair, right? And the, the way to find the pair is to find an approximate value for the ratio, so. Does that answer your, your question, Mark? That's what you meant, right? Can you actually use this to decrypt, right? So if someone publishes a super huge, yeah, okay, right? And the other, the interesting thing about this is basically the public key is something you publish, you, you know, you make it well known, right? So the actual attack doesn't have to happen when you encrypt information. The attack comes as soon as you publish that key, right? As soon as that's available, it doesn't matter what you're gonna encrypt with it because people will start working out what an equivalent super increasing sequence is that can be used to decrypt easily using the greedy algorithm, anything you encrypt with it. So it's a little, it's a, that's why this one's a little bit different, right? Usually when we break a system, we find a way to, on whenever we're presented with the public key plus some ciphertext, there's a way to, to break it, right? This one says, no, 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 you just give me the public key and I'll prepare in advance for the break, right? So it's a little bit different than usual. That's why I wanted to bring it up here in class, okay? In our virtual class. Um, so Jessica says, so there would be several possibilities. Yes, yes. And in fact, so if you want a, uh, if you want a heads up about what's, what's I don't want to overload you now. I realize everyone's working on assignment number three. Assignment number four is going to be straight up crypto, right? So one of the questions is gonna be, here is a trapdoor sequence, right? Here is an approximate value for the ratio. Decrypt this message by coming up with an equivalent super increasing sequence, right? When you do that, your super increasing sequence is not, is very unlikely to be the same as the one that I got or as the one that some, some, somebody else got. Okay, so it's a really good question, Jessica. And the answer is, um, yes, they're all, they can be, there's, I don't know whether there's actually, in fact, there's an, there's an infinite number because there's no upper bound here for you, right? You has a lower bound, right? It can't be less than the sum of all the elements in the sequence, but it can go as sky high as you want it to go. So if you want to code it and have this happen where you is like a five, six digit number, you can go ahead and do that, right? And it'll find one because you've given it a ratio and it'll find that that be inverse. Okay. So yes, there's more than several possibilities for equivalent. I'd say just thinking about it now, there's an infinite possibilities for um, equivalent S. <clears throat> okay. Yep. Good. Um, the complexity of breaking this doesn't change as the size of A. It doesn't change so so mark this is this is the thing when you talk about time complexity right of course if i double this to to eight elements it's going to take more time right but the question you always have to ask yourself is every time i add a single element to it am i doubling or 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 changing the time in an exponential fashion right the rule of thumb for you know determining if something is exp time or not is if I just add one more number to this, does it take twice as long? And the answer is no, it doesn't take twice as long. 
because at the end of the day, I'm doing one more step in my greedy algorithm, right? The, the, and you know, the thing, hopefully you saw this on your quiz when you're answering the question, right? But if you add one more step to a general subset sum problem, which isn't super increasing, then that will double the amount of time because every single element means there's twice as many subsets to search through. Right? So this one, if I add an element, I only add another possible step in the greedy algorithm. So it's really a linear relationship between number of elements and number of steps. Right? And each of these steps is a subtraction, which is gonna be big O of n squared, where n is the number of bits in the largest number in your array, right? So. So no, this is this maintains its polynomial uh, time property, right? Um, if it can still be a viable crypto system given a large number, no, the answer is no, right? Because if you if you so the the way that it works is, I mean, it depends on how how you define it to be you know viable or practical. You could drag this out over you know millions of elements, right? And then the burden on someone to come up for the with the equivalent set S will be uh, will be a, uh, um, just as difficult as it is, as it was for you to compute that original. You know, it's still polynomial time, but it's still going to be roughly the amount of computational time you put in it. Um, but that means it, it's really only how much more time are you willing to put into to your public key, right? As soon as that amount of time has elapsed since you released the public key you're gonna to have to keep switching your public key. You know what I'm saying, right? It's not, it's it's symmetric, right? We don't wanna use crypto systems where the time for you to set it up is roughly equivalent for the time for me to break it down using similar methods, right? So you wanna set up such that it's asymmetric, such that the time for you to set it up is much, much faster than the time for me to break it down, right? And that's EXP time problems, right? You just add one more parameter that happened on your end, that just adds one more step. On a hacker's end, it doubles the amount of time they have to spend. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jessica asks, uh, so hold on. So SNS, is it more effective to use other... Inc yeah, so this one, so, so basically it's not a practical crypto system to use, right? There are other things, other crypto systems based on NP-complete problems. This one was the first sort of one that was thought up. Uh, but this one is definitely not a practical or secure crypto system, right? It's just too easy for someone to go in and start working on your public key, come up with any number of those infinite equivalent um, uh, super increasing sets to decrypt. Um, so Jessica is saying, is there a way of building a super increasing set that would fool the algorithm? Trying to find the ratio. So now you're getting into the nitty gritty details and the answer is yes, you can, you can put in some tricks into how you very carefully start off here and ch carefully choose numbers to go here such that the algorithm will be fooled in its initial guesses, right? But in the long run, it'll still get it. There's always a, so I think um, uh, Shamir, who explored all these, these ideas, right? If you, if you look deep in that article on Shamir's article, you'll find that he, he already went over all those iterations and uh, basically he said, there are things you can do to hobble the effectiveness, of, but then there's things that the, you can do as the user of the algorithm as countermeasures to that, right? So whatever you do over here, there's a way if, if the person running the algorithm says, hmm, this is odd, it's not really getting any, getting any results. Let me try the thing that, that, that you can use as a countermeasure against this. So what he was able to show is it doesn't matter what kind of gimmicks you try to, to put into this to hide the ratio, uh, a, an experienced person using the algorithm will eventually figure out that you've been using those gimmicks and implement a countermeasure. And the countermeasures are obvious for that. So, sorry, but, but the, the research shows that this one's dead, right? It's dead. There's no way to beat it. Don't take it from me, read the article. So it's on Slate. Right, I, I did post it as a resource on Slate. Um, again, the only problem with the, the article is that it goes right into the detail of the linear programming step. And right off the bat, it demands a huge amount of time to sort of wade through line, line by line, right? So I sort of, what I've done on the board here is the quick and easy way, which is 
I bundled it up in something I called the first stage. And then I just threw that away and said, I'm not going to explain how the first stage works. I'm going to say at the end of the first stage, you get a ratio. And once you get the ratio, then you go off and you do your search, right? Okay. So other questions, uh, I gave you, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Chris. Uh, okay. You still use, you use the knapsack algorithm Kiefer? Okay. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> so that is not a, that would be, uh, oh, I don't know. Embarrassing to everyone involved, right? Embarrassing to, <laughs> to not only you, but, uh, perhaps to the shared and security program. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Um, so, I have a question for sure. the assignment. If you have a moment. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was. I was working on uh, 2B where we have to construct a T for N equals 229. Yep. Uh, when I run it through my algorithm, um, I I get that G, uh, if I choose G equals seven, that also gives me um, G to the 228 equals one and I don't get any reoccurring ones. Or if I choose G equals two, that also works. So how do I know which, which G to choose? Do I just choose a- uh, Your choice. Oh, so I can you, just choose two, two? You just have to guarantee that um, two is a witness for that particular, every node is a prime, right? And yeah. you have to guarantee that the, the witness that you tag along, or remember the label consists of prime number followed mm -hmm. by witness. As long as that witness is valid for that prime, you can go ahead and roll out your certificate with that. So what do you mean by witness? Uh... You mean that there's no reoccurring ones using G equals two? That, yeah. So let's, let's say your prime number was 101, right? Yeah. You use a witness of two and by exponentiating two, you can generate the numbers one through a hundred. Then two is a valid witness. I don't know if you can, right? Because yeah. to do that, you have, it's a brute force exponential time thing to find a witness, right? Okay. Which, okay. Like I mentioned last class, it's fine because you're making the certificate. You can use exponential time to cook up your certificate. Right. Perfect. And um, for uh, question 2A, um, on the third step, there's 3, uh, comma G equals 2. And yep. then we also have to calculate it for the fourth step. Can I just mention it that, oh, I just calculated this in the previous step? For 3 if, and the witness. Two. Yeah, for sure. If you don't have to do copies of, I guess if you have multiple, if you, are you talking about if you have multiple factors of 2? in the prime factorization? Uh, no, I meant like, uh, you know how you're breaking it down that we have the prime 173, yeah. witness two, yeah. then 43, witness three, then yeah. we have three prime and our witness is two. Yeah. And then on the next step, our prime is also three and the witness right. is two, but I've already calculated my, uh, my checks on, in the previous step. So I don't really need to do it for the next step right I can just refer back oh i see yeah if you yeah, if you already have yeah this. if you already have the verification calculations for a specific prime with a specific base then you don't have to do those again right okay do i, I, that's what you're do I yeah, yeah yeah do i tell you that i'm yeah, not yeah, doing it can, because of this you can say calculation all already done in this in this part right okay so i don't i don't need to see the read because all you're going to do really is just write the thing over again and i'm not even going to read it right so yeah so there's it. the original calculator i don't need to read that you did it again i saw it right okay thanks so for sure you don't need to do repeat calculations but you have to do every new calculation you have to do right because that's the that's demonstrating that look we're, we're showing every single thing that had to be done and it's contained on whatever two or three pieces of paper Yep, got which it. is and which is much much faster than taking that number, whatever it was, one hundred seventy three, or you name the prime and dividing by every single integer up to the square root of n, right? The square root of that prime. Yeah, got it. And uh, to show the method uh, that what we use to find the witness for the prime factor, um, do I include like my uh, code like Python file or yeah, can I just... yeah. So take a so put it into the PDF document. PDF? Right? Okay, just so screenshot you, it. Yeah, so you can screenshot it or something and just include it at the end and say this is the the code that I use to so you know the witness I, I use this code to determine the valid witness for whatever for this right. Okay. Then you code you you have a screenshot of that showing that this is how you found the witnesses. I got That's it. Cool. Thank you. Yep.
Good. Yeah. Uh, okay. So ooh, we're already running a little behind schedule for our meeting. So, um, so what we'll do is um, we'll end this meeting now and we'll switch over. So we do have our quiz meetings. Um, so who's up first? So Harjo, Dallas, and Sad. So you guys are first today. Um, so we have our quiz meetings today. Uh, don't forget, so those of you who don't have your quiz meetings today, the assignment, the multiple choice is due tomorrow, right? And so is the written component. Um, so hopefully you have a chance sometime, if you haven't done so, between, uh, you know, now and tomorrow at 11.59 to finish those, those two things up, right? Um, if you're running late on the assignment three, it will be open till Sunday night, but at Sunday night, I'm going to close it and end it. And the reason for that is it's just easier for me to, um, uh, I just prefer to have an end date where I don't, I know there's no more assignments coming in. And if someone asks a question in class saying, can you, I just solve it, right? Or post solutions, right? There has to be a time where we say, no, nope, now it's over. <laughs> over means over. Okay. So if you do need extra time, you can take it, right? And submit it late with late penalty. Uh, but that will be over Saturday and Sunday, but Sunday night it's closed. Okay. Um, yeah. So Jamie, if you haven't started, now's a good time to start, right? <laughs> so start coding your, uh, your primality certificate method. <laughs> good. Um, Sarah says, could we still email? Absolutely. Right. So you can, so if, if you still, you know, if you get a question or you're working on it today or tomorrow or whatever, just send me an email. Be very, very specific, and I'll try to um, to uh, help you out, All right? Good. Okay, so we'll end our meeting now, end meeting, and we'll switch over, and meeting, and meeting, meeting, and we'll switch over to the individual meetings. Again, those of you who have them. All right, see you later. Okay, thanks, bye. Yep, bye-bye.